So a while back, I made a video about ice balls and how they form. But did you know there's also rock balls? Yes, that's right. There are giant balls made of rock that are made completely under natural geological processes that I will be talking about in today's video. So before we jump right into these amazing rock ball formations, I do want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an amazing online learning platform that has thousands of courses that make learning STEM concepts really fun and engaging. So stick around to the end to hear more about Brilliant and get a special offer I have just for you guys. Now back to the video. Let's first start with some of the regions where you might find these rock balls. These include places like the aptly named Bowling Ball Beach in Northern California, the Valley of the Moon, which I'll be talking a lot about in today's video, which is in Argentina, Beach Omaru uh, in New Zealand with these huge concretions, that's a rock hammer for scale, um, and then Torish Valley, um, which is, it means Valley of Balls, I believe, <laughs> in Kazakhstan, and I'll talk about that one a lot today too, and the aptly named Pumpkin Patch in California, California and Moki Marbles, hope I'm pronouncing that right, in Utah. First things first, we'll talk about the rock balls in Valley of the Moon in Argentina. Basically, this landscape dates back to the Triassic around 250 to 200 million years ago, which is likely the time in which these balls formed, and it also contains some of the oldest dinosaur fossils, which is really cool because dinosaurs evolved during the Triassic and then dominated the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods of the Mesozoic. The place where the rock balls are found in this park is called the bowling field, and most of them are surprisingly like detached from the surface and can now be further polished by weathering. Like I mentioned, there's also the Valley of Balls or Torish Valley in Kazakhstan. And these rock balls can range in size from just several centimeters to several meters in diameter, which as you can see over here on the right, can get insanely huge. These enormous balls likely formed in this region in Kazakhstan in the mid-Jurassic to the early Cretaceous periods around 180 to 120 million years ago. So again, quite a long time ago. And these rock balls are what we call in geological terms, giant concretions. But what are concretions exactly? So concretions are basically minerals precipitated in layers, concentric layers around a nucleus, which just means a grain, a rock grain, a shell grain, a bone grain, or fragment um, of any sort. It could be any kind of foreign object that then gets minerals precipitated around it. Most concretions are not very large, and I'll talk about one example later on in this video called ooids. I've talked about ooids in a lot of my videos, but they're kind of like micro, very tiny um, concretions that form concentric layers around a tiny fragment nucleus and those are very common but these big rock balls as you can see are not as common in you know on earth they're only found in select regions because of their unusual shape giant concretions are often mistaken for fossils such as egg fossils or turtle shells or some other kind of round type fossils and I talk more about this concept of mistaking non-fossils for fossils in my recent pseudo-fossil video, which I'll link to the top right if you want to check it out. Some people, however, have even suggested that these are artifacts, these large concretions are artifacts of ancient advanced civilizations. Uh, so are these balls evidence for intelligent civilizations over 200 million years ago? Well, probably not. One you know, there wasn't any humans or anything like humanoid organisms on Earth over 200 million years ago. <laughs> Were there ancient intelligent aliens that did this? Probably not. There's actually simple explanation for how they formed. First and foremost, let's get context as to what kind of rocks are in these regions. Well, the Taurus Valley, for example, is made mostly of limestone and sandstone, likely deposited in Mesozoic seas because they're dated back to the Mesozoic, and limestone and sandstone are facies often found in shallow seas. 
What's really important about these rocks in terms of concretion formation is that they're porous and permeable, which is ideal for these rock balls or concretions to form. How so? How does this work? Well, let me talk a little bit about some concretions that I've talked about previously on my channel and then get into how these rock concretions form. Because I've talked on my channel before about ooids and ice balls, ooids are tiny microscopic concretions. As you can see here, they look like little tiny grains of sand. These are tiny concretions that form from minerals precipitating around a nucleus. Again, that can be a tiny mineral fragment, a tiny organic fragment, whatever. Um, and these minerals precipitate in concentric layers, as we can see by this tiny microscopic image here, around the nucleus as the ooid rolls back and forth in a veil very shallow sea environment, which induces more precipitation around that nucleus, and they are made of calcium carbonate material. Ice balls form in a very similar way, or a very similar wave motion driven process, where the waves push them back and forth, polishing the ice crystals into forming these perfect spheres. And if you want to check out my ice ball video and exactly how they form, I'll link it to the top right for you. But what's very interesting about these huge rock concretions is that unlike ooids and ice balls, they don't form at our surface and they don't form due to wave action at our surface. In fact, they form deep underground. So like that begs the question, how do they become round? How do they grow? That makes no sense. Well, here's how it works. So first and foremost, it starts with a nucleus, just like ooid formation, a piece of organic debris or a mineral grain, whatever it might be. Precipitation begins around that nucleus. In other words, minerals like calcium carbonate or silica, which is just the chemical composition of quartz, chalcedony, agate type minerals, silica makes up a lot of different minerals, calcium carbonates, things like aragonite, calcite, and these minerals will precipitate around the nucleus from groundwater that's permeating through those sedimentary layers. This leads to concentric layers around that nucleus grain over time forming huge concretions. And just to make sure we're all clear on definitions here, precipitation just means solid minerals forming from fluids rich in their dissolved ions. So this is where the very much importance of permeability and porosity in the sediments comes into play. It has to have the ability for groundwater to flow through it, that sediment, in order for the groundwater to carry the dissolved ions like calcium and carbonate ions or siliceous ions to that nucleus and to that next layer and then form the next layer and then form the next layer. And this is the transport of these ions to the nucleus and precipitation around that nucleus, that's what that means. Precipitation just means like mineral formation. Calcium carbonate and silica are commonly the composition of such concretions because they're soluble. So they can be carried by groundwater and then re-precipitated. Um, and they become enriched in groundwater over time because they're very common. They're very common in most sedimentary deposits, especially in sedimentary deposits that have a lot of limestone, which contains calcium carbonate and sandstone, which contains silica. And so because that's the composition of a lot of these places that have the concretions, it makes a lot of sense that they would form there because one, those sediments, those rocks when forming are porous and permeable, and they're the composition that allows groundwater to pick up calcium and carbonate and silica ions and transport it in the water to a nucleus, to a concretion. Over time, layer by layer, the concretion grows, gradually increasing in size. And we can often, because of this, see the concentric layers, like tree rings, if we were to cut a concretion in half. These concretions, although round, are very different than geodes. You might be thinking, oh, something else that's round in geology are geodes. Do these form the same way? But they're very different. They actually don't form, well, they form, I don't know, somewhat similarly, they involve hydrothermal mineral rich fluids flowing through rock and depositing or precipitating out minerals. But the growth 
of geodes is inward rather than outward. In other words, instead of forming concentric layers around a nucleus over time, it actually kind of fills a crack or crevice in the rocks that was there by precipitating minerals on the edge of the crack or crevice and migrating inward with more precipitation um, until the center cavity is filled with like that last layer of crystalline precipitate and then you know eventually that is exposed at the surface and someone cuts it open and sees that cavity with layers and then the internal part that's crystalline and so geodes form differently typically in higher temperature scenarios and just outward to inward rather than the other way around so in terms of concretion as sedimentation continues in other words the deposition of sediment onto the overlaying sediment this uh, graphic that I made is not entirely accurate because obviously these were formed in a sandstone and limestone rich shallow sea environment so ignore the grass here pretend it's a shallow sea environment um, but in any case <laughs> as sedimentation continues in that shallow sea environment the concretion gets deeper and deeper and pressure from the overlying sediments and compaction from this contributes to concretion growth into a larger, more spherical uh, structure. But how does compaction make it larger? How is there space for growth of the concretion if it's surrounded by material, especially if the pressure around it is becoming greater? Well, here's again where porosity and permeability comes into play a bit. Basically, um, porosity is the pore space uh, between grains and sediment, and permeability is just the ability for fluid to transmit through those sediments. In other words, you can have a porous rock that's not permeable because maybe it has a lot of pore space, but they're not interconnected pores. Whereas if you have pores and they're interconnected, that allows the transmission of fluid through all of those pore spaces and through that rock layer. And that's permeable and porous. So you want both porosity and permeability in this case in order to allow the fluid transmission through these pore spaces. And eventually, as fluid flows through these interconnected permeable pore spaces in the sediment, minerals like calcium carbonate and silica can precipitate out in these pore spaces, typically along grain boundaries. Concretion growth can exert pressure on the surrounding sediments. So instead of just pressure being exerted on the concretion, it's also exerting pressure on the surrounding sediments. And this pressure can lead to displacement of the surrounding sediments, especially in permeable and porous sediment, which can allow more precipitation around the concretion. And this pressure can sometimes induce uh, the dissolution of these sediments and also allow more uh, precipitation and growth around the concretion. Also, the stimulation of fluid movement in sediment layers, which is induced by increased pressure around the concretion, leads to the preferential dissolution of the more soluble minerals within the heterogeneous sediment surrounding the concretion. In other words, the sediment surrounding the concretion is more a mixture of a bunch of different things rather than a very homogeneous pure either calcium carbonate or silica ball like the concretion is. So it's more susceptible to dissolution or incongruent dissolution uh, in the outer parts of the sediment surrounding that big ball and that can lead to more concretion growth because when those ions in that sediment surrounding the ball dissolve they then get transported through the groundwater and that you know is already kind of at the concretion and then can promote precipitation of another concentric layer around the concretion. Ultimately, these concretions have to remain in a relatively favorable position for a very long, geologically long time. That is millions of years. What do we mean by favorable position? Well, for example, they might be in a mineral precipitation favoring zone um, or mineral formation favoring zone, which is receiving mineral rich fluids from a dissolution favoring zone. This can be hydrothermal fluids from a nearby magma chamber of some sort, which is causing the dissolution of a lot of minerals and the transport of those ions to 
nearby places that might have concretion growth going on. And in some conditions, like I talked about earlier, it's possible that the concretion itself can promote the dissolution and recrystallization of surrounding material. For example, again, the surrounding minerals are more heterogeneous and thus more susceptible to dissolution, typically. Um, and also, kinetically, precipitation of minerals is favored at concretion surfaces because one, these surfaces have nucleation sites, which means that dissolved ions can attach to those and precipitate and kind of grow that precipitate. And two, mineral precipitation is often favored on surfaces of the same composition rather than different compositions. So in other words, for example, calcite precipitation is often favored on a calcitic surface over, for example, a silicate surface, whereas silica precipitation is favored on silicate surfaces over, for example, calcitic surfaces. Why? Because when the calcium and carbonate ions are in solution and they're flowing around a calcium carbonate mineral, there might be a carbonate ion in a nucleation site on that mineral surface that the calcium ion, cation, is attracted to, and that allows the calcium cation in solution to kind of attach onto that, bond with it, and kind of, it's this chain reaction that is induced because these ions like reacting with each other, which is why they form these minerals. So typically the surface of a concretion is potentially more favorable for the precipitation of ions like calcium carbonate out as calcium carbonate or calcite minerals um, and silica ions as silica minerals um, on surfaces that match their composition. Eventually, after formation, these rock balls can, because of geological forces and erosion processes, be exposed at the surface and eventually, over time, can even detach uh, due to weathering and erosion from the surrounding rock or the substrate, allowing them to even move around and kind of become even more polished spheres um, if wind and water that's near them is strong enough to move them around. So. Unlike most of the concretions we talked about in, in most of these regions that I listed at the beginning of the video, Moki marbles or Mokai marbles in Utah are a bit different. They're not calcite and they're not silica. They're actually iron concretions. They're made of iron, which you can kind of probably tell from their blackish to reddish to orangish color. They form as iron rich minerals precipitate in porous sandstone, so a similar formation process. Basically weak acids or possibly hydrocarbons like petroleum flow through permeable sandstone and dissolve ions like iron. These acids or fluids then become rich in iron and this iron rich fluid eventually precipitates out the iron minerals when it gets to a more either very saturated in iron and it has to precipitate out as iron minerals or just to a chemical environment in which iron precipitation is now um, favored rather than iron dissolution and they precipitate out around sand grains typically like clumps like big aggregated sand grains rather than like a single grain and this leads to their centers typically being composed of sand and this process leads to the iron concretion formation some studies have even suggested that microbes may be involved in helping produce the iron oxides or induce the precipitation of the iron out as iron oxides in these concretion forms, um, but it's likely a very indirect effect and they can probably form just as well abiotically. Interestingly enough, we actually found very similar iron type concretions on Mars and have called them Martian blueberries. However, they're thought to form very similarly to the iron concretions we find here on Earth. This actually, because we know that iron concretions on Earth require water to form, this actually provided some of the first evidence for water in Mars's ancient history. Now, currently we have a lot more evidence for water in ancient, uh, on ancient Mars as well as current Mars, uh, but when this was found in 2004 by the Opportunity rover, 
this was some of the first evidence for water on Mars, well, ancient Mars, to form these concretions because they would have had to have water transport iron uh, ions and, and reprecipitate the iron in the concretion form. If microbes are found to be involved in this process on Earth, this could also provide evidence for potential ancient life on Mars. Um, but again, with biosignatures, we have to be really careful because if there's any possibility that such, you know, formations or structures can be formed abiotically, then it obviously isn't evidence for life on Mars, at least not concrete evidence. So I hope you guys enjoyed learning about these giant rock ball formations as much as I have. And if you guys would like to go into anything geoscience related or studying things like this or anything really STEM related in the future, I highly recommend you check out Brilliant. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, Brilliant is an amazing online learning platform that provides thousands of courses that help you learn skills like understanding how to analyze the data, how to look at correlation, how to look at probability, how to look at just the science of everyday life activities, which is really cool. Not only because sometimes you need to understand these concepts for your job like I do, but also just it's really cool to understand the science of everyday things just as a regular human that doesn't need those skills for their job. It's just a really fun tool to increase these skills and to increase your kind of awareness of the science around you, which is awesome. And it's super interactive, which, you know, I wish I could make my videos more interactive for you guys, but since I can't, the best I can do is offer you this amazing, brilliant deal. You can use my link down in my description box Box below or in the pinned comment to check out Brilliant for free for 30 days. That is a premium Brilliant experience with access to all of their amazing courses for a 30 day trial. And if you like it, you can get 20% off an annual Brilliant subscription. That is 20% off a full year of all that Brilliant has to offer. And that is at brilliant.org geogirl. So check out that link down below and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.